Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 418, the General Convention 79 News Update. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Jeff Walton, and it's July 10th, 2018. As everybody who's a regular viewer knows, every once in a while we have people from outside the normal circles uh, of journalism, as in viewership. Jeff Walton is a print journalist, and he actually does a lot of investigative reporting for IRD. Uh, for some of you, that's a that's a buzzword um, that he's part of the evil empire, but it's not true. What does the IRD do? Uh, Kevin, we're the Institute on Religion and Democracy. We're a small Christian think tank located in Washington, D.C., and we monitor, report on, and occasionally critique uh, public policy statements from uh, mainland Protestant churches, and we also advocate on international religious freedom issues. You are also an Anglican. Yes, I am. I direct IRD's Anglican program. We have denominational programs in the United Methodist Church, Presbyterian Church, uh, an evangelical program, and an Anglican program. So I handle Anglican Communion, Episcopal Church, ACNA stuff. Uh, we got back from uh, GAFCON, and George said, I can't do it. I'm tired. I can't I, fly Gavin in. I'm not a flying Gavin in to go to all the way to Austin. I'm not going to go either. Nobody wanted to go to, to Austin to cover this because I General Convention not. can be really <laughs> a horrible experience. Let's send Jeff. Well, Jeff, your, your IRD sent you down there, and you've been giving mm -hmm. us wonderful updates of, I'll be honest, the Cookie Convention from Austin. And uh, uh, a lot's going on. Let's cover the three big issues, the prayer book, the mandatory uh, same-sex marriage, and uh, other things. First, prayer book. Is it going to be modified? If so, when? If so, why not? Yeah, the prayer book modification is something that a lot of people have spoken out against and indicated that they are not on board with. And it's interesting because the opposition to re uh, going revising the Book of Common Prayer which was uh, is about 40 years old now, the 1979 revision, that that would be something that would uh, uh, cut across different silos of, of different people in the church. Uh, in the House of Deputies, which passed prayer book revision by about a two-to-one margin, um, a lot of the folks who were against it were actually not people who were theologically conservative. Uh, however, they were concerned that the prayer book revision was either unnecessary, would be very expensive. It's estimated that it would probably cost between 8 and $10 million by the time this process is done. And uh, in addition to that, uh, the book compare is something that um, a wholesale revision of, or I should say a comprehensive revision of, is something that many leaders in the church feel the church is not in a place to do right now. So we'll see what happens in the House of Bishops, but the House of Deputies did move ahead with beginning this process, but there was a lot of skepticism. What's, what's involved in changing the prayer book then? Why does it cost so much? Uh, it involves a significant listening process that involves every diocese of the church. Uh, there's a group called the Standing Commission on Liturgy and Music, which is basically charged with pursuing this. Mm -hmm. And what it entails is going around having meetings to see liturgically how these resources are already used by uh, parishes across the church. So it, it's a very extensive multi-year process. Um, and uh, once there is a final version, even then it has to be ratified on a second reading by a subsequent general convention. So what we're talking about here is probably a prayer book if they went ahead with the process now that wouldn't be completed until at least 2030. Well, as Archbishop Cramner will tell you, uh He's not here anymore. Uh, nobody likes it. No, not everybody is happy with the, the final version of a prayer book. And uh, the 50, 50, 1554 got a lot of complaints. And the 1662, you know, you just go on down the line. Uh, and I remember being in a uh, uh, meeting with a bunch of ACN people. This is before the ACN. And uh, somebody mentioned how much they do not like the 1979 prayer book. And this meeting just melted down. There are so many opinions. So I can't imagine what it's like to get it through uh, a liberal general convention. It, it, obviously, um, it would be fun to watch, though. Jeff, let's move on to some of the other uh, things they're talking about. They want to make same-sex marriage mandatory. 
No depot. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want it, it's mm-hmm. going to be in your church with a priest, your priest or priest of your choosing. Um, and your bishop mm-hmm. can't do a darn thing about it. Yeah, uh, this is an example of what Father Richard John Newhouse famously said, that where orthodoxy is optional, sooner or later, orthodoxy is proscribed. That's correct. Um, so what happened, just to walk it back a little bit, in 2012, uh, General Convention in Indianapolis authorized bishops to have a pastoral option to make same-sex marriages uh, in the church available. Mm-hmm. Cut three years later in Salt Lake City, and what was formally adopted as a trial right. Now, a trial right means that, unlike something that's part of the Book of Common Prayer, a diocesan bishop has the ability to determine whether or not their clergy and churches can use that right. Uh, currently, there are eight domestic dioceses in the Episcopal Church, including several overseas province, nine dioceses in addition to that which do not allow use of the right. Uh, This has not been something that the LGBT activists within the Episcopal Church are okay with, uh, because even though we're talking a very small minority of dioceses out of 110, um, there is a significant desire, as the Reverend Susan Russell, a clergy deputy from the Diocese of Los Angeles, said, which is that uh, access to these trial rights should not be based upon your zip code. Uh, So, as a result of that, what they want to do is take out of the hands of the diocese and bishops the ability to uh, proscribe this right. And they want to make sure that any same-sex couple uh, can get married in their church uh, using the trial right. And that's something that is um, significantly controversial within the House of Bishops, but actually in the House of Deputies was passed pretty overwhelmingly. Uh, and once again, you know, as far as I can tell, General Convention has lost its conservative voice, but the moderates are, aren't, uh, the bishops at least, are not uh, too bad at holding the line. Yeah, the, the House of Bishops traditionally has been uh, much more reluctant to endorse some of these innovations. Uh, even if something is adopted by the General Convention, it's usually not the same thing that comes out of House of Deputies, which is just far more revisionist and progressive. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens, but uh, there is uh, a lot of concern across different deputations as far as what should this look like. Um, the two things I'm going to mention are uh, there was a clergy deputy from the Diocese of Rhode Island who got up and spoke yesterday in front of the House of Deputies, and he said, uh, I want to caution everyone that we shouldn't be voting people off the island and the Episcopal Church is a very tiny island and this resolution would effectively vote people off the island. Let's move on um, to just uh, social networking in general. I was watching videos by uh, Bishop Greg Brewer. I was seeing updates from Bishop Dan Martins. I've heard a lot of undercurrents, but the, the biggest thing I've heard is there's just yeah, no there there anymore. Uh, the war has been fought. Uh, the Episcopal Church, depending on who you are, you've won or you've mm-hmm. lost. But because there's nothing to fight for anymore, um, the energy's gone. Yeah, this is notably a different feel than some of the previous general conventions. Um, now, it, it is still a large group of people who are getting together. But uh, you don't have as many activist groups getting together uh, and uh, circulating uh, that there is just a, a sense that, that things are generally calmer. Uh, this doesn't mean that there's agreement on everything, but uh, you don't see these big pitched legislative battles that we saw in the last decade. I remember Minnesota? <sighs> probably, it was, that was probably before your time. Uh, it was but, actually. My first general convention was Austin in 2009. So okay. this was general convention number four for me. <laughs> I did 2006. Mm-hmm. I remember 2003. I just, you know, it was always just megaphones. You had CNN. You had Fox News. You had mm-hmm. all these satellite trucks. Now you can't mm-hmm. even get Anglican TV to show up. <laughs> yeah, there was, uh, I believe there was a reporter from Religion News Service who I uh, saw at one of the press conferences uh, but other than that, I have not seen any real outside media 
Um, there are folks like me who are lay people who are doing independent reporting and uh, the Living Church has a large team there. But as far as folks from outside of kind of the Anglican circles, uh, not, a, not a huge amount of, of interest so far, even though uh, the Episcopal Church's uh, media folks are, are justifiably trying to capitalize on uh, Bishop Curry's uh, recent royal wedding um, uh, high profile status. And um, there, there's some awareness of that, but uh, that that's not the same as as action taking place in general convention that is seen as worthy of large scale media attention in, in secular media. So let's just uh, um, make the big announcement now. Mm -hmm. All right. Integrity has a new leader. Uh, yes. And a new and a new name <laughs> and a new name. Uh, bring us up to date on that. Yeah, uh, Integrity, just for the, your viewers who don't know, is a 43-year-old activist organization that operates within the Episcopal Church. It's basically the unofficial LGBT caucus. And it's been working uh, to promote what they would say greater access and inclusion uh, over the last four decades within the Episcopal Church. Uh, but there's two things that have really significantly changed. One is they've decided they need to change their name. Uh, as of the end of General Convention, Integrity USA is no longer going to be known as that. It will now be known as the Episcopal Rainbow. And the so idea is... They, they couldn't live up to Integrity? All right. I'll write that down. Well, here. they wanted something that specifically reflected their place within the Episcopal Church. And they felt that the word Integrity wasn't specifically addressing their denominational connection and their focus. So they made that change. And then another change that happened is a new leader. Uh, some of you uh, who are watching this program may recall a clergy person uh, named Greg Fry, who back in 2014 was uh, a rector of a parish in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And he very suddenly announced during a sermon that he was, in fact, transgender and would be undergoing a process to become someone who identified as a trans woman and uh, would be taking the name Gwen. Uh, that was a really big issue uh, in 2014 because there was a lot of pragmatic concerns about how is somebody going to undergo a gender, gender, trans, gender reassignment transition while they are uh, basically leading a parish. Um, so the, uh, Greg Fry met with um, the Bishop of Arkansas at the time, and they basically decided that he would be removed from that, uh, from, from that parish. And uh, that happened. So uh, now, living as Gwen Fry, uh, th this, uh, uh, this clergy person is now the uh, new incoming president of, in of the former Integrity USA, now the Episcopal Rainbow. Uh, so you've got the first transgender leader of this LGBT caucus. I was just watching parades in London and Europe over Pride where the transgenders and the lesbians were at war with each other. It's going to be interesting to watch what happens here with the, uh, the Episcopal rainbow. Um, anything else to report? Or, uh, it's not over yet, is it? It is not over yet. Uh, oh. General Convention continues through Friday afternoon. <gasps> so good. we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm still watching what House of Deputies is going to be doing in regards to prayer book revision. And, uh, of course, the, the, as I said, the, the marriage stuff. Uh -huh. And then I'm also following a lot of the political resolutions which come out of general convention. Uh, there's some contentious uh, Israel-Palestine stuff that there was a special session uh, yesterday afternoon that was devoted towards. And, um, you know, there, there, there's the typical things that you get. Yeah, there's over 400 resolutions which are introduced in the legislative process in this general convention alone. So there's a big uh, committee structure that's bureaucratic that things have to go through. And uh, some of these will be placed on a consent calendar and effectively rubber stamped. Others uh, will kind of go off and die. Uh, and of course, anything that the House of Deputies does that the House of Bishops doesn't act on by the end of general convention just kind of disappears. Uh, it, it doesn't get taken up. So uh, there's a lot of different stuff to, to watch and see if it uh, actually gains traction. All right. Well, Jeff, I want to thank you for your time. Let's give a quick plug to where they can read your stuff. I'm sorry, say again? Where can they go read your stuff? Oh, yes. Uh, you can read all of my stuff at www.theird.org. That's theird.org. We also have a blog, which is connected to that site, called Juicy Ecumenism. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, you and Kevin uh, really post my stuff on the um, Anglican Inc. Uh, site as well. 
I'm Kevin. I think you mean me and George. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what right. <laughs> happens all the time. <laughs> You're not the first one to do that, and you won't be the last. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Jeff Walton. And you've been watching Anglican Unscripted, episode 418. <laughs>